thanking the speakers that we have. We have an amazing group of panelists, and I'm going to introduce each and one of them um, to get us started. Um, so the first um, panelist is going to be Candice. Candice Fortin, she is a political organizer, producer, and consultant. Candice's political work is centered around racial justice and equity. She has worked over on over 15 campaigns all over the US, including a um, movement building team of the Racial Justice Organization of the Color of Change. She's also a co-founder of the nonprofit collection Haven. Our second panelist that we have today is Tiffany um, Lofton. Hi, Tiffany, welcome. She recently um, served as the National Director for the Youth and College Division at the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Her mission there was to train and organize and uplift um, young leaders everywhere to fight for racial, social, and economic equity of all people. We're so excited to have her here. She's also a labor um, civil rights organizer and has been featured nationally, including on Fox News, ABC, People's World, and we are so happy to have her. And Sean, welcome, Sean. Sean is also here. He is a political and nonprofit consultant with over two decades of experience. He has worked with a number of nonprofits and social justice organizations, um, including um, rank choice voting. And to date, Sean has managed over a dozen um, candidates and issue campaigns. And so we are so excited to have each one of our panelists um, with us. This is great. They're here to educate and to get us feeling empowered to go out and vote in the coming election. We're going to get started. Um, Sean, you can take it away. We're going to do a training first, and then we're going to get into some um, panel discussion and then some Q&A from um, the audience. Sean? Awesome. Give me just one moment. There we go. Are you able to see my screen? Good to go? Yes, we see your screen. Awesome. So we are going to start off with a quick conversation and presentation on ranked choice voting, which is new in New York City. Um, so we're going to start off with a recap of the changes coming up to local elections and how we got here. So in 2009, there was a costly low turnout runoff election for public advocate and comptroller that prompted the debate over the use of runoff elections in New York City. For those of you who may have been around, you'll remember that only 250,000 voters out of over 2.5 million registered Democrats in the city showed up for that election. And the city spent over $20 million to, to host that runoff election. I'm sure each of us can think of something that the city could do uh, with $20 million. Um, so in 2010, then city council member Gail Brewer introduced the first ranked choice voting legislation. Uh, in 2010 and again in 2018, charter revision commissions met. Uh, those are entities that explore the city's charter, which is essentially the city's constitution. Uh, that 2018 commission held dozens of public hearings across the city and heard from hundreds and hundreds of residents and organizations about the need for there to be ranked choice voting in New York City. So that 2018 commission voted 14 to one to place what became question one on the November 2019 ballot and voters overwhelmingly by nearly 75% of the vote voted to implement the first ranked choice voting elections in New York City. So why ranked choice voting and why now? Um, as you all may know, the city recently instituted term limits for city council members. That has led to 32 open city council, open council seats this election cycle alone. Those 32 open seats, along with a robust campaign finance system that the city offers, has led to a wealth of diverse candidates. Um, at last count, it was 411 people filed to run for office in this June election alone. Um, under the previous system, those candidates would have risked splitting the vote 
and someone being elected uh, with less than a majority. Um, and so it also meant, means that in, under the former system, a city council member could be elected with as little as 20% of the vote. That means 80% of voters voted for someone else and did not have their voice heard in the final results. So ranked choice voting fixes that. So starting this year, all local primary and special elections for city council, borough president, public advocate, comptroller, and mayor will be ranked choice voting elections. That means that you all as voters now have the option to rank your up to five candidates, including a write-in, um, in each of those races. It also means a candidate will need at least 50% plus one of the vote in order to win, and that runoffs no longer happen. Um, instead, we use this system. So some important dates to remember. Election day is Tuesday, June 22nd. Last day to register to vote is May 28th. Uh, last day to change your address if you're already registered to vote is June 2nd. Early voting starts on a very, very, very important day. I personally feel it should be a national holiday. Um, hopefully you all have it marked on your calendars. It's my birthday. Uh, <laughs> So uh, in lieu of gifts and money, um, actually I might still take money, but in lieu of gifts, you can go uh, early vote on Saturday, June 12th, and that runs through Sunday, June 20th. So when you're thinking about ranked choice voting and your candidates, um, here's a good way to figure out how you're gonna rank your candidates. We like to see your first choice as the candidate you love, it's the candidate you may contribute to or volunteer for, but at the very least, it's the candidate you're talking to your friends, your family, and your neighbors about. It's that person who's from your community. It's that person who shares your values. It's that person who shares your positions on issues. Similarly, your second choice um, may not be from your community, but they still share your positions on issues and share your values. Your third and your fourth choice you know, may not be there with be there with you on every issue, uh, may not share all of your values, but it's still someone you think will do a good job in office. And your fifth choice is a candidate uh, in previous elections you may have had to hold your nose to vote for. Um, you know, they may not be there with you on all the issues, but you still think they'll do a good job in office, and they're definitely better than all of the other candidates remaining in the race that you are not ranking. Um, ranked choice voting does not change this, but one thing to remember when you're voting, never vote for someone you don't like. Same is true under ranked choice voting. So we're gonna go through a quick video um, that talks a little bit more about ranked choice voting. Hi, I'm Lucky, and welcome to my bodega. As you may know, New York City has a new way to vote in special and primary elections. So, how does ranked choice voting work? The next time you vote in a city election, instead of choosing just one candidate, you can rank them all from your first choice to your fifth. Here's how it works. Let's say my bodega is picking its featured snack of the month. So many choices! Which one should I feature? This customer ranks Parker Pressels as her top favorite. She also ranks her second choice, Mr. Chips, third choice, Chi Chi Chicharrones, fourth choice, Gladys Gummies, and fifth choice, Puppy Popcorn. Other customers rank their choices as well. If Parker Pretzels is the favorite choice and wins more than 50% of all the first ranked choices, then Parker Pretzels is the winner and is featured as a snack of the month. However, if no snack gets more than 50%, then the least popular snack is eliminated. Sorry, Piggy Bars. The remaining second ranked choices from customers who chose Piggy Bars are redistributed. So if customers chose chips and chicharrones as second choices, then those two snacks receive additional votes. The new totals are counted and the process repeats until there's a winner of the final two. Congrats, Poppy Popcorn, you're the bodega snack favorite. Back in the real world, before it's time to vote for humans, visit ranktovotenyc.org for more information. Thank you, New York City, for voting and for making these special and primary elections your election. 
All right, so that's an example from Bodega World. Um, let's jump into what your ballot will look like. Um, so this is an example from the Board of Elections. Uh, here you see four races on one ballot, so mayor, public advocate, comptroller, and council member. Um, the reality is because there are so many people running for mayor and so many people running for comptroller and so many people running for council member that your ballot will be double-sided. So you will need to remember to flip it over to continue to vote in ranked choice voting elections. Um, and so here you see that the candidates are in rows and your choices are in columns. So you will go column by column, picking your first choice, your candidates for second choice, your third choice, and so on. Um, so the counting rounds only kick in if no candidate receives 50% plus one of first choice of votes. Um, and as under existing state law, the official winner will not be declared until all votes are counted. So we know that's about a three week process as mandated by existing state law. So the Board of Elections is not able to start counting absentee votes until seven days after election day. And they're not able to start counting militaries overseas, ba overseas ballots until 13 days after election day. On top of that, there is a period of time in which uh, absentee voters can cure their ballot. That means to fix any problems that are on the ballot envelope like not signing it or the signature not matching. Um, and so that brings us up, up to about three weeks after election day. At that point, um, once the counting is complete, the tabulation process, as we just saw in the video, so the rounds of elimination only take about 30 seconds. They're hitting the, hitting the button on a keyboard. So ranked choice voting does not add any time to the counting process. Once that's all done, uh, the round-by-round -round vote totals will be released to the general public in a bar graph format. So why should you rank your ballot? We like to say it gives you more choice and more power. More choice because the more people you rank on your ballot, the longer you have a voice in the process and the longer that your ballot continues to work for you. And more power because ranked choice voting forces candidates to talk to every single voter. No longer can they be elected with just a small subset of the population. Even if your favorite candidate doesn't win, you still have a say in who's elected. You can vote your conscience without worrying that you're wasting your vote. And ranking a second, third, fourth, or fifth choice will never hurt your favorite candidate because those rankings only kick in if your favorite candidate has already lost the race and been eliminated. So let's quickly go through frequently asked questions before we wrap up. Um, how many candidates do I rank? Again, you can rank up to five candidates or as few as you like. Do I have to use all five rankings? No, your vote will still count if you only vote for one person or a few. Can I rank a candidate more than once? This is important. It does not help your favorite candidate to rank them more than once. Remember, your vote stays with that candidate until they've lost the race and been eliminated. So ranking them a second time or including them on your ballot a second time is not a magical cure that will bring them back from the dead in the race. Um, they're gone. It, however, it does hurt you and your ability to continue to have a say in the election because you're not able to rank other people if you're ranking someone else in that spot. Does it hurt my favorite candidate to have a second choice? Again, no. Your second, third, fourth, or fifth choices only kick in if your favorite candidate has already lost the race and been eliminated. So what do you wanna walk out of this remembering? Uh, that starting this year, you will have the option to rank your top five candidates in our local primary and special elections for mayor, comptroller, public advocate, borough president, and city council. You can still vote for just one candidate or up to five, and we encourage you to rank your ballot because there's no more worrying about wasting your vote, accidentally helping to elect someone you don't support, um, someone splitting the vote, or someone being elected with less than a majority. So this presentation, along with the video 
and simple one-page explainers are available in 13 different languages on our website, rankthevotenyc.org. You can also request this training or a slightly longer one on our website as well. With that, I will turn it back over to you to the host. Thank you, Sean. I hope you guys took your notes, are ready to vote. My birthday is in June too, so I will definitely be remembering that as well. Um, so thank you, Sean, for um, telling us what we need to do. Drop it in the chat, y'all, if you've already been following who's on your ballot, if you've been paying attention to the, um, the race that's been happening. And I'm going to ask you guys, this is your call to action. Make sure that you tell about three people about ranked choice voting, right? Test your skills right now. Tell them about what it is and how to do it and make sure that they also have a plan for how to get to the polls. So thank you, Sean, for that. So we're gonna jump right into our discussion for this morning. And I'm gonna just start with Sean since you already told us a little bit about what ranked choice voting is. Can you talk to us a little bit about what are some of those advantages and disadvantages um, disadvantages to this system? And what does the data already show about Black people's attitude towards this system? So ranked choice voting really allows for us to have a more of a voice and a say in the process. You know, under the previous system, if we voted for someone and they lost the race, that was it. We no longer had a say in the results of that election. Um, with ranked choice voting, we are able to continue to vote for folks who speak to our communities and speak to our values. Um, you know, often people in our communities, especially younger folks, are told to wait their turn, that they may risk splitting the vote, that someone may get elected who doesn't represent us if, if we run for office. Ranked choice voting fixes that. There's no longer ha worrying about having to wait your turn. Um, we know money in politics is a barrier to uh, folks running for office, especially Black folks and women and queer folks. And so there's no longer a worry about having to raise money for a second election, for that runoff election. Um, so all of those are benefits. We've actually done exit polling. There have been four um, special elections in New York already this year that have been ranked choice voting elections. And we found that black folks love it. 67% of black voters that we surveyed said they prefer ranked choice voting to the old form of voting and would actually like to see it instituted for all races in New York. So that's exciting. 95% um, of voters said they found the ballot easy to understand and the same is true across ages, from 18-year-olds to 70-year-olds. Um, yeah, so we're seeing lots of benefits here. Awesome. That's really good to hear as well as we try to get engage our community even more. Um, drop it in the chat, everyone. If you have any questions for our panelists, we'll be checking the chat. So also drop your questions as well. And so just to follow up, after the last presidential election, there has been a huge backlash which has shaped itself into changes into voting laws across some states, including Georgia and Florida, which affects, we know, a lot of people of color. So my question is, how do we protect people of color from disenfranchisement? And the second part is, there ha um, there is a bill, the For the People Act, and how does that help us when we're talking about protecting voter um, rights? Anyone feel free to jump in on that one. Is Candy's trying to come off mute? Oh, okay. You were looking at your computer or the screen. Hey, everybody. First of all, thank you to the young professionals of the New York Urban League for having me. Um, this conversation is super important. I don't know if folks watched the uh, the debates with the mayors. Not too, it was maybe two days ago, I think. Um, but you should have. And if you didn't, it's also on YouTube where you can watch it. Uh, it I think it's really important. And lessons that I've learned in my civic engagement work over the last 12 years is that I need to hear directly from the candidate's mouth myself, right? We can read about it, 
but I am a, a kinesthetic learner. I need to be able to see them, read them, hear them, touch them. Like I need to be, I need to be around all of that. Um, and there were some alarming things that came up, of course, that are national debates, things around defunding the police, education access, um, reinstating and opening schools again because of COVID or uh, work placement or uh, minimum wage. There are a lot of debates that are happening national across the country. And our, our, those mayor mayoral candidates spoke a lot about them. And so it should be clear, I, I am one of those people who organizes folks and says, listen, if I just give you the information, more than likely, I trust you to make the best choice for you and your communities. So if you didn't watch the debates, you can go to YouTube to watch them. Uh, to answer the questions around, you know, what are things that we can do to protect our people? I, I'm currently in Georgia where, you know, the NAACP state conference just defeated the bill that was trying to disenfranchise voters. Uh, it is a, a trend that we see happening and we know why, so we don't have to preach to the choir. You know, we know that if our folks turn out, then other folks won't win. And so we need to be able to protect uh, our vote. I want to adjust the language so that we can think about it a different way, because I'm talking to a bunch of leaders across New York who are in multifaceted careers and are students and young leaders who are uh, in, at their church who are going to be having these discussions with other people. And here's the frame that I want us to switch. Uh, I, I do think it's important that we figure out how to protect the vote. But I also want to figure out how do we fight back against these uh, uh, voter disenfranchisement laws, voter suppression bills, so that we are uh, advantageously figuring out how, how do we turn out more people constantly. And uh, my sister, Latasha Brown, over at uh, Black Voters Matter uh, is launching a bus tour actually this June. Shout out to, I don't know why June is a big thing. I'm an Aries. My birthday was in April. If y'all want to go ahead and get some love, I'm not going to take it from you, but that's how we do. So but in June, there's a bus tour that's happening to commemorate the freedom rides uh, of the South to encourage Black folks to turn out to vote. And as we think about protection, I want to think also about like defense. We got to protect what we have. We got to get more. We have to turn people out to vote. We have to educate folks. We have to give people the tools and the resources that they need uh, so that they can make the best choices for themselves, their families, and their communities. And if we do things like that, then if we make if we do things like that, then I, I think we make it personal. If we make elections personal then people won't feel like it's a game. People won't feel like it's hard to navigate or manage. They'll be more likely or inclined to look for the information themselves. Uh, an example of that is last year during the lockdown, we, uh, we had a loud cry from NAACP youth leaders around the country who understood the bare minimum. It's important to vote. They understand, we all understand that for the most part. Making it personal, they didn't understand. Well, what does a mayor do? What does the city council member do? What does the school board member do? What does uh, the president actually get to do? What happens with the electoral college? How does it actually actually work? Uh, you know, who gets to make the decisions? Why does the secretary of state get to decide at the last minute that they're going to purge uh, ballots? So it, it, what is that process? And the easier we make it for folks to understand, the more likely they are to stay involved. Um, when we do that, the, the, the opportunity for folks to turn people out for elections doesn't just uh, stay in their organization, doesn't just stay on their social media platform, then they're going to also follow up with those people. So last year when we had the lockdown, the, the youth and college students across the country were saying, we understand it's important to vote, but we need the tools and the information, the connections and the resources to expand the information. So we hosted a Black Civic Summer course. It was five Tuesdays in the evening, and we had two hours worth of information and action. When, when I talk about elections, I am not subtracting that from the issues that we're facing when it comes to justice for Breonna Taylor. I spent a month and a half in Louisville with those folks, and we had to, we had to help them draw the lines themselves between Breonna Taylor, Daniel Cameron, and, and elections, right? When we make that uh, more personal, then folks are able to connect to it. So I, I do think it's important that we figure out how do we protect the people of color, right, <laughs> vote. But we got to make it more personal and we have to make it more accessible for our people. And then I think we won't be on the side of the protection. I think we'll be on the side of, listen, we got to, every, every, no matter what election, special election, whether it's Louisiana, whether it's New York, whether it's Virginia, whether it's the DA's race that's happening in Philly, people are going to turn out because they understand that it is personal for them and their families. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tiffany, for that. Did anyone else want to jump in? 
So as you said to um, Tiffany, as a as, as an educator, um, I teach fourth and fifth grade. Um, that civics education in school is so super important. And a lot of times I find myself it not being part of a curriculum. I have to kind of do that work. Um, for my students to educate them and they in turn are sharing it with their families and their communities as well to kind of get that but i love what you said about like making it personal and about the issues that we care about and that kind of gives me um to my next question as as this is the state of young black new york how do we keep our candidates and politicians accountable to the agenda to the black agenda when we think about police reform job accessibility when we think about investing in the community and our business how do we make sure that they're accountable yeah i can hop in here my name is candace uh, i'm a virgo i don't know if that okay <laughs> <laughs> All right, I feel like I'm in like a Gemini Aries world. It's a little, it's a little off for you. It's okay, it's all right. Um, so I wanted to share. We had a program that we did for the uh, St. Louis DA uh, that was uh, an endorsement plus accountability program. Um, so basically, um, if we are going to endorse you you need to uh, agree to these policy measures. Like we need to make sure that your platform is completely on point. We need to make sure that you are completely like on the left, pro-abolition, all of that. And then there's a 90 day accountability plan. Um, and that can look in a lot of different ways, but basically like, okay, you said you're gonna do this, what's the time frame for that? You said you're gonna do that, what's the time frame for that? And then also being cognizant that if you don't meet these demands, we will start to organize against you. So for not just a blind endorsement, uh, don't get comfortable, especially if you want to have a second term. Um, we will be on you the entire time. We're going to start on those 90 days. And if we don't see what we need to see, we will start putting petitions against you. We will take money away from your next election. We will uh, organize outside of your office. Like no one is safe. And I think that's a really important thing, especially for, let's say, like incumbents who are very, very comfortable, who feel like, you know, they can just say one thing and then like the minute they hop over that fence and are elected that they don't have to do anything. And I think it's a really staying on them and being and doing that in a timely way. Uh, to give a great example, let's talk about Biden, for example, right? Like, you know, right. <laughs> There's a lot of folks who are like, okay, we got we to get Trump out, right? So like, we saw Biden doing a lot of stuff and feeling that pressure and feeling like he had to get those votes, seeing him get elected, seeing that things started to not quite go exactly the way that we, uh, that, that we were told they were going to go. Like we could talk about the student loan debt, the COVID relief, all of this stuff. So you have to stay on him, you know? You have to do that public pressure. You have to say, you are not safe. You may not get reelected again. Uh, we're not, we're gonna put someone else who's stronger against you. And we have started to see there's, there's been a shift, right? Like, I feel like he's done better uh, in the past, like, let's say, what month is it? Five months than he has in maybe the past 30 years of his career because there's public pressure, because we're like, we're not doing this again. We're not gonna, we're not gonna just like eat this up and then stand up for him and say like, oh, you know, he just like, He's just uh, figuring things out or, you know, just give him a chance, no more chances. We are, we, these are people's lives that are at stake, right? There's people who are getting deported. There's people who need relief right now. There are people who are getting evicted. Like these are serious, serious issues. They need to be taken seriously. And so you can use the power of social media. You can use the power of direct action. Um, there's, there's a lot of different tools that people have ready, ready at their hands, but it, I think it's about being really timely with these things and uh, not letting things slide. Like put people on a schedule, you know, put them on task. And I think that's a really great way to start. Awesome. Anyone else want to jump in there? You've answered that beautifully. The only thing I would add is um, what I have found is be best practice. And I also do this for like companies that I spend a lot of money with. So like Delta Airlines and Enterprises, I follow them all on social media. And um, I, you know, we used to call it bird dogging, folks call it trolling, whatever it is. But when, when there are candidates that uh, you either appreciate or don't appreciate what they're doing, following them on social media and engaging them with them on social media is actually really important and it's super easy and accessible. You can do it straight from your phone. So in addition to everything that Candace said, just follow your elected officials on social media too. Awesome, yes. I, I stay um, hitting them up. My library is currently closed. So I'm like, um, hello, when, when are you guys gonna open back up my library? So I, <laughs> I do that all the time. So yes to that. And you know, everybody's on social media. So um, you can slide in that DM and let them know. 
Uh, so thank you for that. And so you guys spoke a little bit too about, um, you know, like just organizing and having people um, being involved um, and organizing drives to get people out to vote. And so my question is, so what are some things that we can do, some creative ways that, what, that we can drive and push civic engagement in the African-American community? Um, sometimes the door-to-door the -door doesn't work. So what are some of those things that we can really do to make sure that we are getting up and voting and not just thinking about those national elections, but those local ones as well? So I'll start off by saying, just like as we speak, Rank the Vote NYC has over 100 volunteers, including folks from NAACP and Color of Change, out in the streets of New York talking to voters about ranked choice voting. Um, we're in 50 locations today and 50 locations tomorrow um, in the streets. We have about 150 people currently making phone calls and doing text messages uh, to new voters, you know, not just the folks that traditionally turn out to elections, but the folks that need that little extra push to vote in a primary election. Um, there are additional creative ways. I know NAACP, the state NAACP is doing a caravan through Manhattan next Saturday um, with cars and posters and a DJ on a flatbed truck and just going around and at stoplights, like when they hit a red light, going out and dashing and handing out information and getting back in the car and continuing to drive. So there are fun ways to get involved and do things. Um, I would encourage folks to go to our website, rankthevotenyc.org. We actually have a citywide calendar. So any event, any organization that's doing our ranked choice voting, education or reaching out to communities are on that calendar. Um, and so that's a great way for folks to plug in on the ground this election cycle um, in a nonpartisan way. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll hop in, I'll say uh, on the color change side or with color change pack, um, it's labeled voting while black, which is our shirt because I have to hit the street soon. But um, we um, historically started doing these events called Black Women's Brunch, which was a really successful way to bring Black women together. We know that you know Black women are the most reliable voting bloc, but oftentimes are not uplifted, are not involved in the work, have no voice in the work. So it was a way for us to bring Black women together, eating food, listening to good music, day, tipping some mimosas, and then like talking about the issues that you know like really matter. And the thing that I think made it really strong as far as recruitment is that um, obviously we're in a pinch right now, but that we did it. Uh, about six months before the election. So like really giving time to connect people to the issues. I know Tiffany was lifting this up before, but uh, making sure that it's not just about the election, but like what issues are connected to that, what makes it real for you, what's happening in your community and like how can we tie that in? So before even talking about the election, we talked about the issues first and foremost. And I think the more that we can create spaces like that, the better. So whether it's Black Women's Brunch or we've done like block parties, um, we've done like second line, um, you know, marches in New Orleans just to get folks involved or like, you know, some great like drive-in concerts, things like that, just functions because we know that Black folks like to gather. We know Black folks like to come together. Um, that's the way that we really build community. That's, what, that's the way we can see ourselves and see our power. And then we can talk about what it looks like, you know, to to uh, vote for someone or is that like, is that really the, the most, um, uh, I guess, tangible stepping stone. Um, so I think it's really important to build community, even if it's uh, like a small group of your friends and you're like, you know, every Sunday, I'm gonna just put together a little function at my house and we'll tip mimosas and like phone bank, like that's cute, you know, whatever works for you, but it doesn't have to be, you know, just like, um, like Sean was saying, just like, you know, knocking on doors and, you know, making phone calls and that's it. Like there's so many other ways that we can like bridge communities so that folks really feel like they wanna come back and that they have a community involved with them. Um, but I think like most importantly, outside of this election, once we get past June 22nd, it's important to think about how we're gonna involve folks in those conversations outside 
transaction cycle. So it doesn't feel transactional because I feel like oftentimes black folks are spoken to, you know, at the last minute, you know, like, oh, we got to get those votes. We have to get those votes instead of prioritizing it. Uh, and we have to learn how to do that ourselves. So uh, it's that. And also, I believe building uh, leadership within the black community. A lot of times that doesn't happen. So you have a lot of folks who are out there knocking doors who don't look like us. Uh, and those people need to get paid. Like we need to find people who live in NYCHA who are working. We need to find people who are houseless who are working for us. They need to get paid. They need to get equity. They need to be the people leading these communities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Tiffany, did you want to jump in um, with anything that you guys have been doing as well? Sure. I was going to let us go to the next question. Um, I, you know, when we talk about being creative or doing creative things, there are a lot of things that work really well. Um, and one of the things that works really well is uh, giving people not just pay, but giving them titles and opportunities to create their own events. Um, I find that when I call somebody a volunteer, you know, I, I, I get great turnout, but when I name somebody the voter engagement coordinator for the East region, they're like, oh, yep, that's my title. I got a responsibility and now I got to organize other volunteers. And so we're, I'm in the business of creating more leaders, right? And giving people more opportunities to not only just put on their resume, but also gain experience in doing this work so that they can do it on their own. Um, we saw last year a lot of really creative things that worked and didn't work. Last year was hard because it was all digital and virtual. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the students were hosting like Netflix and chill parties virtually to turn out people to vote. People were hosting panel discussions with elected officials and doing online debates. Folks were doing Twitter town halls and Twitter storms. Uh, people were doing a lot of texting, right? There was a lot of text message bank programs. But uh, what I find, uh, all of that is great and we can be creative about all things we want. We could pass out t-shirts and mail people prizes and all that's wonderful. But what works is when we follow up with people. So when I send somebody, I'll give you an example. I'm helping with the DA's race in Philly. I sent a, a message to a bookstore in Philadelphia and I said, hey, I don't see anything on your page or on your thing about voting. Are you encouraging people to vote? They said yes in a nonpartisan way. I said, cool, can you all post something? They didn't know what to post. And I was like, oh, well then let me get information for you, send it to you. Maybe you can use this, turn it into a graphic, make it a poster, put it on your, on, on your page or on your uh, bookstore. They said, great. Today I followed up. I didn't see nothing there. So now I got to follow up and help them. Why didn't you all post it? When we follow up with people, that is, it's not just dra dropping the seed and saying, oh, great, I contacted 100 of my friends today or I posted, you know, go vote on my Instagram and I got 60 likes. That's not enough. Like, you got to right. be able to, <laughs> that is not organizing. That's not being a leader. What works is when we follow up with people. Hey, mama, did you vote? You did? <laughs> How did you feel about you voting, right? Who did you go with? Okay, well, did uncle vote? Okay, cool. Well, let me call two of my friends at school and see if they voted. Did my teacher vote, right? Like, is my teacher encouraging people to turn out for elections? Maybe they'll let me make an announcement before class starts. Shout out to all the graduates in 2021. So I think that there are ways that we can do this uh, 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 creatively, but uh, I want you all to walk away with, we got to follow up. If you're not following people that you turn out, then you're not really doing the work. You're doing something that's a little bit less effective. Right. Following up absolutely just like that job you want and you follow up with them um you got to follow up with voting making sure people know like this is as you or guys if I said, I my friends, or um, if I lend yes. Sean twenty dollars and Sean don't pay me back I'm gonna be harassing Sean like Sean, that's how much right was that? that's oh, right next week I'm gonna say I thought you got it in cash app no I didn't get it in cash app <laughs> I don't see no twenty dollars from you, you gotta send it back to me right so that when we talk about accountability follow up that we do it in our everyday lives already we got to be able to put it to our politics too. Sean don't owe me no money. Just to be, I was gonna say, just to be clear, I, I don't owe Tiffany no money. <laughs> we would follow up for you, Tiff, if it was the case. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, y'all. Um, so, just the final question. So, um, we've talked about um, what voting can look like, how to engage people, but I'm sure some people might even be on this. Um, session, I might be thinking about like running for office, I might be thinking about how they can get engaged. And so what are some of the ways that we can build um, Black political power in our local and state and national levels as we, we want to see more people like us in office? Um, what advice or resources that might be out there for people who are looking for that? And in your response, if you want to just add your final comment as we are going to be transitioning soon. One thing I always tell people um, to think about, which is something I think a lot of folks skip because we've, we've always kind of created these like, you know, 
little columns where you can fit into being um, involved is first of all, figuring out what you care about. Cause it's not just, you know, like, oh, I'm black. So, you know, like some people care about, you know, reproductive health. Some people have personal stories about the healthcare system. Some people have personal stories about being evicted. Like if I would talk about, I would think about that first, like what is your own issue? How have you been impacted? Um, like what story do you have to tell? Cause that's how you're gonna be able to build power, right? Um, like, do you have an immigration story? Do you have something like that? Um, Cause then you can authentically really build communities. Also figuring out what you're good at. Cause you know, not everyone wants to knock doors and that's okay. But you know, I know some people who like have just cooked for a whole election cycle and saved us, like literally, you know, just like the food was a blessing in and of itself, took a lot of stress, uh, created a lot of like safety and environment that made people feel good. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do that are not just in that transactional space. Um, so I think like starting there is really, really important. Um, I think also just being involved in community work in general, like we saw, like I was very impressed by the mutual aid efforts that have been happening all across this country. Um, how people just said, you know, car, I can drive some groceries over. I got a bike, I can deliver something. I got $10, I can donate. Um, I have a space where I can hold some supplies. Like that was a really beautiful thing. And I think we have to figure out how we can build those kind of community mechanisms outside of the electoral space. Um, because whenever you want to run, it's a lot, you know, and I'm not trying to detract people from doing it, but I think like we haven't, we're, we're not really coaching people to really understand like where their story is in that and like what community they really represent and how they can really, um, you know, help. Um, so I, I would just say start there as a starting point. Awesome, thank you. I'll say um, it's, a per it's a pet peeve of mine. When people just jump into a race and have never been involved in their community. Um, so be involved. Be involved long before you decide to run for office. You know, I'm not talking six months, I'm talking years. That also builds a base for you because people will see you doing the work. They will think of you as the person who gets it done. And if they do that, they're more likely to volunteer for your campaign. They're more likely to give you money. They're more likely to support because they've seen you there supporting the community. Um, that is my number one thing. You know, there are a lot of great organizations that provide leadership trainings. And I know there's Built the Bench in New York. There's Run for Something. Um, there's a bunch of great organizations that do that work of training folks. But be involved in your community. And so one way to be involved uh, is we actually have some job openings that we are looking to fill in the next week. So we're looking to bring on a team of 10 additional organizers, full-time organizers citywide. That's available on our website, rankthevotenyc.org. We're also pulling together a field canvas team. So we're hiring 40 canvassers we are hiring Canvas leads, um, and all of that will be available on our website next week. So just continue to check in with us. We pay a living wage. We're not one of those organizations that, you know, says here's a couple of cents. Um, we want folks to be able to live and thrive. So, um, yeah, check us out. Thank you, Sean. I'll send my resume over. All right. All okay. right. All right, Tiff, um, final words? Sure. Um, the first thing I would say is I need y'all to read. If you're thinking about running for office, I need you to read, 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 read. Um, I don't care what you read at this point. I just need you to read. <laughs> uh, we jump into a lot of things with our uh, personal experiences. Uh, like my, you know, like fellow panelists have said, you know, not working with the community, not working with other organizations, not having any sort of uh, roots or, or basis for what we're running for, except that we want to run because we don't like the person who's currently in office. And I think those intentions are, are you know, great sometimes, um, but you, you got to read. Um, and so that's one, two, I, I lived in DC for the last 10, 11 years. And there were candidates that I saw, I went to their website to see who I was going to vote for. And uh, they didn't have their platform up. The only two things they had on their platform was vote or volunteer, excuse me, donate or volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, and so anybody who's running, like you've got to make sure you have a very clear, digestible platform for, for me, <laughs> right? I don't want to be on your page 
for 20 hours trying to figure out what it is that you stand for or what it is that you're going to fight for or what it is that you have done. I'm trying to see it very quickly and yet to make it easy for people to understand. And then there are three resources I'm going to give folks. The first is um, Emerge America. Uh, my sister Shanti Gola over there runs an executive director. They train folks on how to run for office. That's Emerge America. The second is, of course, Stephanie Brown James and Quentin James run the Collective Black Pack. Uh, you need to Google that and it's the Collective Pack. It's a pack that supports Black candidates. Uh, and then the third is the Young Elected Leaders Network. Young Elected Officials, YEO. Um, that's for folks who are already elected, but I think it's important to talk to people who have the job that you want to get. So you probably should find that group of people. It's the young elected officials, uh, the people who are under 35 years old who have ran for office. And this is not, you know, just House and, and, and excuse me, House and Senate and Congress. It's also local, a lot of local races. Um, some incredible, incredible young people are in that network that I know. And so uh, the young elected officials network is really important to look into. And then, the, so, you know, the last thing that I would say is thank you all so much for having me. I, I think it's really important that we remember how important and valuable spaces like this are, uh, organizations like this are. I got involved in this work because I joined an organization, right, at, at, at 19 years old. Uh, and here I am at 32, still working, still involved. And it's not a career of mine and has become my life's work. And so, you know, as we think about ways that we can continue to do what we want to do, I got to surround myself with people who challenge me, people who strengthen me, people who agree with me, uh, and folks who will teach me new things. So be open to that, stay involved, uh, be a part of an organization, be a part of multiple organizations. And I appreciate y'all so much for having me. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, um, everyone, for for this amazing, um, empowering, empowering and enlightened conversation. And as always, I just want to just remind everybody about just of the, some of the things that we talked about. Remember to vote. Primary is coming up June 21, um, 2020, 21. Sorry. Um, I hope that this conversation has inspired all of you to not only vote, but to encourage others as well. And so thank you to our amazing panelists, Sean, Candice, um, Candice and Tiffany. So happy to have you with